يا يحيى خذ الكتاب بقوة وآتيناه الحكم صبيا إذ قال الله يا عيسى إني متوفيك ورافعك إلي محمد رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سورة النحل لسورة of النعم لسورة of favors of الله سبحانه وتعالى one favor after the other. There are endless and countless favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that should leave the believers with nothing but gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their hearts are full of gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it shows how much the disbelievers are ungrateful to Allah when they are immersed in the endless bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are not grateful to Allah by not worshipping Him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the favors of Allah for people to see the power of Allah and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maintain the life that people live, whether it's physically or means of guidance, that people need to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave His creation like this without guidance, that guidance are made very clear to the people and the message has been conveyed perfectly for people to see the truth and to hold fast to the truth and so on. Inshallah ta'ala will go through verses number 43 uh, till verse number 50 from 43 to verse number 50 in Surah Al-Nahl to show some of the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of earth that it all can be related to the power of Allah the nations before this Ummah of the Prophet والسلام, clear evidences from uh, the final revelation from Allah for people to reflect uh, warnings verses that brings the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hearts to the disbelievers and to those who spread mischief on the face of earth. What do they think they're upon? Uh, are they secure from the punishment of Allah? And then the fact that everything is in state, state of humbleness, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they, they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and human beings need to learn from this. So let's start inshallah ta'ala with verse number 43. In Surah Al-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْرِكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And we sent not before you except men to whom we revealed our message. So ask the people of the message if you do not know. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ uh, The like of these uh, verses we saw before in the Qur'an. Uh, the sentence starts with negating something and then there is an exception which is exactly like la ilaha illallah it starts with negating and then exception that gives the most exclusive uh, meaning of things so that's why la ilaha illallah does not leave any chances for someone to believe that other than Allah can be worshipped besides Allah because it says la ilaha illallah no one is worthy of worship except Allah doesn't leave anything else so here the same concept, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ We have not sent before you, إِلَّا رِجَالًا Except men, so only men, that's one of the matters of belief here. There's no female messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but then, إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ That we reveal to them. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا So the messengers of Allah, they were men and they receive revelation from Allah. They receive revelation from Allah, message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them to convey. That's what the job of the messengers are. And the ayah clearly states this. So, إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So as the people of the dhikr, the people of a dhikr are the, basically the people of knowledge. Those who, uh, they took the wahi revelation from Allah, and they uh, studied it, and they conveyed it, and they taught it to people. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And then it becomes a general statement 
that always uh, we, we say this uh, statement, this part of the verse, فَاسْأَلُوا أَلَى الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ As the people of knowledge, if you do not know. Human beings are the original status of the human beings that they are upon jahl, they are upon ignorance. We do not know till we get to know. So uh, knowledge requires for a person to acquire it. It doesn't come by default. We have to acquire knowledge to have knowledge. So for someone to think that because they're 30 years old or 40 years old, that they have already have knowledge. And when you see people talking about the religion, just because they have ability to think, they think that they have something to say, you have to acquire the knowledge to be able to talk about the subject of knowledge. And people respect that so much with worldly matters. Nobody would speak about a very uh, important subject in medicine, for example, unless you have learned it from its people. So you don't give your opinion, you know, when it comes to what medicine to take and what this and that and or, or, to, or to do surgery, uh, you know, without learning how to do it. Uh, the same thing with building a building, with anything that people do. And what's more important than all of this is the wahi revelation from Allah, the matters of unseen, the matter of uh, the guidance for people. People need to acquire that knowledge. And if they don't have the knowledge, what do they do? as the people of knowledge. So that gives a perfect life with the perfect types of individuals in a society. Those who are learned versus those who are not learned. Those who are learned, they have a huge responsibility to convey the message, not to hide anything of the truth. And responsibility of the rest are to ask the people of knowledge or to seek knowledge. And as Ali ibn Abi Talib عنه, he made it very clear that people are of three categories. Alim al-Rabbani, a person of knowledge, Rabbani, that means he's a lordly person, someone that is upon the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the knowledge of the wahi. He's not seeking knowledge to have fame or status or money, it's only for the sake of Allah. The second category of people, Muta'allimun uh, ala sabili najah, that someone that is seeking knowledge on the path of salvation, he wants to save himself, so he's seeking that knowledge that want to be from the first category. And the third category, which you don't want to be with, Hamajun Ri'a'a, which basically, uh, the rest of the people, they are in, in chaos. They are upon يَتْبَعُونَ كُلَّ نَاعِقْ They follow anyone that have a loud voice, or maybe looks like he's intellectual, or he speaks in, a, in, a, in, a, in an eloquent way. They just follow whoever. And that's what we see the reality of humanity nowadays. Right? Do they really follow people based on knowledge or based on fame or based on uh, being deceived by uh, emotions maybe? Or you, you would find which is something that is so amazing and I don't want to go out of the subject. When people would follow uh, or they claim that this is the truth based on a movie or based on a drama, how can that be with people of reason to think that the shaitan can deceive them to believe in something and they would follow him. Is this is how to seek the truth? You know, this is, people don't even learn worldly matters like this. Right? You don't learn medicine by watching a movie, how to be a doctor. Right? And we have to respect ilm, we have to respect knowledge. And this is what basically the verses is, is, is given it very clear to us. As the people of knowledge, if you do not know, if you don't have the knowledge, as the people of knowledge. And if you claim that there's no people of knowledge, if you claim which is not true, then uh, go somewhere and, and live and don't interact with people whatsoever because you need knowledge in every day uh, interaction and everything in our life. How can a person pray? How can a person believe? How can a person live and, or get married or have children without knowledge? So either we have it or we seek knowledge from the people of knowledge. Otherwise, the worst category is when it's not part of knowledge, not part of ilm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly makes it as an act of obedience to Allah that we ask the people of knowledge. And the people of knowledge, they have a responsibility not to conceal the knowledge, right, and so on. But is this knowledge like this, we ask the people of knowledge and we blindly follow whatever they say if they are corrupted or whatever? But the next verse makes the matter very clear. Verse number 44, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالزُّبُرِ 
وأنزلنا إليك الذكر لتبين للناس ما نزل إليهم ولعلهم يتفكرون he says we send them with clear proofs and written ordinance and we reveal to you the message that you may make clear to the people what was sent down to them and that they might give thought so بالبينati والزبر it's a continuation of the previous verse as the people of knowledge if you do not know بالبينati والزبر that means with clear proofs and, uh, and evidences uh, that, that's what the pe- that, that's what ilm is ilm is not making the people of knowledge holy or that they are divine they can say whatever they want because we gave them the title of people of knowledge no, what is knowledge what, why there are the people of knowledge what is knowledge knowledge is qala allah qala rasuluhu qala sahaba like this this is knowledge is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said and understood what the aim of this deen were upon this. So this is what ilm is. So the knowledge is basically al-bayyinat wa zubur is the clear proofs which is the wahy and al zubur anything that is written uh, originally this is what it means. So that's why when it says the written ordinances something that is written in the books so the evidences. So the people of knowledge in the deen of al-Islam are not people that are given some holiness that they can just say to the people whatever they want to say and people just blind, uh, blindly follow them. This is not the case in the deen of Islam. And at the same time, it's not like it's left to every individual to be convinced or not based on what the people of knowledge they say. As some deviant, they try to spread among people. Just listen to whoever from among the people of knowledge. Listen to that person and that person. What makes sense to you? What's easier for you? Just take it. This is not knowledge. This is nonsense. Right? But the proper knowledge is that based on the revelation from Allah, Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet, والسلام, how it was reserved for us and for the, the best generation ever brought to mankind, how they understood the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. والسلام. Is that knowledge is preserved for us? Of course, definitely, no doubt. So, how can we acquire this knowledge? Through the ways of the people of knowledge. This is the subject of knowledge. And when a person would acquire this, and by the way, the people of knowledge are people of both information, which is knowledge, and actions. They apply it. If they don't apply it, they're not people of knowledge. And they are not people to be followed in, in this case. So, بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ zubur as a clear evidence that when we seek knowledge from the people of knowledge, the people of knowledge are nothing but basically ways for us to get to know what's in the بَيِّنَاتِ zubur, what's in the clear proofs and and written ordinances, the evidences, and they just clear the way to us. They don't uh, become an obstacle for people to learn the deen. They don't hide anything from the truth. They convey it to the people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says uh, and a very important part of the verse that is an evidence of how the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be followed in its totality. It says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَى لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ Addressing the Prophet ﷺ, we brought down to you, O Muhammad ﷺ, الذكر. What is الذك? The message. Right? Literally, that's what it means. What has been brought down to the Prophet ﷺ? Two things. The Qur'an and the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet ﷺ, also was brought down to the Prophet ﷺ. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was not the Prophet ﷺ's own, opini- own opinions. It was revelation from Allah. As Hassan ibn Atiyah, he said, كَانَ جِبْرِيل, Jibreel alayhi salam, كَانَ يَنزِلُ He used to come down to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam بِالسُنَّة With the Sunnah, the same way, كَمَا كَانَ يَنزِلُ بِالْقُرْآنِ The same way that he used to come down with the Qur'an, he used to come down with the Sunnah. And a very clear example to this, who taught the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam how to make salah? There's no mention of it in details of Qiyam and Ruku' and Sujood and Takbiratul Ihram and uh, Fur Raka' for Dhuhr and all of these types of things. It's not in the Quran. But how did the Prophet والسلام, did the acts of worship? Jibreel السلام, Angel Jibreel السلام, came down to the Prophet والسلام, taught him what to, how to pray and when to pray, the beginning of times, the end of times, and so on. So, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ We brought down to you a dhikr. For what reason? لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ To make clear to the people مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ What has been brought down unto them. 
So as some of the ulama, they say two things here are mentioned, a dhikr and what's been brought down to them, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The Sunnah is revealed to explain the Qur'an. The Sunnah explains the Qur'an. The Qur'an is not just, or the, the, the religion of Islam is not just uh, verses that has no reality to it and people, they have the freedom to uh, interpret it the way they like. If you hear someone saying that, you run away from that person, he's a deviant. This Qur'an has been interpreted in the speech and actions of the life of the Prophet ﷺ perfectly. And it's binding upon each and every one of us to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ in understanding the Qur'an, in applying the Qur'an. And also the companions عنهم, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, for the rest of the ummah is to follow the ways of the companions عنهم, by the statement of the Qur'an. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ The foremost of the muhajirin and the ansar and those who followed them with goodness, Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. So to make clear to the people what it's been brought down to them and for people to reflect وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ and to reflect based on ilm, based on knowledge and what's mentioned in the revelation from Allah. We continue inshaAllah ta'ala uh, after the break with the rest of the verses to stay with us inshaAllah. محمد رسول الله محمد رسول الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وكم باك and with verses forty three to verse number fifty from سورة النحل and we just talked about verse forty three and forty four these verses requires more and more uh, things for us to mention and to revisit it but I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us benefit from what we hear after what we heard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send messengers men conveying to them uh, to the people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and this is the not this is the ilm this is the knowledge and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to ask the people of knowledge with clear evidences and written ordinances and uh, showing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down to the Prophet والسلام, both the Qur'an and the Sunnah uh, to make clear to the people what has been revealed and brought down and for people to reflect before we get to the next verse التفكر, or to, to think right? Uh, it has to be based on ilm and the ayah is a clear evidence of that we're not called to reflect or to think with ignorance because when people think they have to have some given things, right? For them to take these given things, to think and to build on whatever is given to them, to build on that, to think in the proper way, right? For example, again, I always refer to, to, refer to materialistic matters. If someone, for example, if people discussing medicine, right? Am I allowed to discuss or to think about a medical solution to a problem or to a disease? I'm not allowed to do that because I didn't study. There's no given things to me, the knowledge that is sufficient for me to start thinking or to research and so on because I'm not qualified to do so. So the same thing with anything that we think about. right? It is not based on foundation of ignorance. Otherwise, your thinking would be ignorance. You have to have a foundation of knowledge to be able to think in the proper way. So for those who want to think and reflect upon what's in the Qur'an, they need to have the knowledge of it, or they seek this help from the people of knowledge. If people want to reflect upon the wahi from Allah, they need to study the wahi from Allah. Not that any X and Z and Y, they can talk about the deen of Allah and reflect and say why this is like this, why this is like that, which is what chaos that we see, you know, when everybody is allowed to speak and everybody allowed to have a channel in which he would convey whatever he wants, based on knowledge or based on ignorance, this is where the chaos that we have. And you would find people would, they say, I heard someone saying such and such about, or things like this about the deen. Who is that person? Nobody knows where he comes from. And then we become responsible for, uh, you know, talking about this or refuting this. From the very beginning, right, when, when we don't allow ourselves to listen to those who are not qualified, that makes it then easier for us. And we see this as a clear evidence in the Qur'an. But then uh, let's go then to the next verse, which is part of what is being mentioned. And for the people to see the power of Allah, for us to see the power of Allah that we need to reflect. 
and this is how to reflect in the proper way. The Quran teaches us this. Verse number 45, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَأَمِنَ الَّذِينَ مَكَرُوا السَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَخْصِفَ اللَّهُ بِهِمُ الْأَرْضَ أَوْ يَأْتِيَهُمُ الْعَذَابُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And that will be continued. Then do those who have planned evil deeds feel secure that Allah would not cause the earth to swallow them or that the punishment would not come upon them from where they do not perceive? So this is a question and the answer to it is very obvious. It's addressing those who makaru sayyat, those who planned evil. And al-makr, as we mentioned it before, it's when someone plots in a hidden way for something evil. And that's something that many people, they do that. Disbelievers, those who oppose the truth, things like this. So they plot hidden plots. And when you have plots, or people are hidden plotting against something, that is not going to be from you know, up front like this evil. But they would have some good things in their plot, or good statements, or they want peace to others. They want what is best for others. They want freedom or the rights of those who are weak, all kinds of nice you know, slogans that they would throw out there for people to be deceived. But the reality of it is, it's a step and a, one thing closer to the other to establish if you look at where they're starting their plots and where they end, it ends in the hellfire. And it ends in the hellfire with, uh, before that even, with clear calling people to be upon evil, clear evil. But they don't start all of a sudden with evil. It takes them, this is what makaru sayyat, they plot evil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning them because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in their hearts. If they can deceive the, the believers, yes, they're believe, human beings versus human beings. We can easily be deceived by others. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect us when we, look, when we know what's in the Quran. And if you know that some people, they might be plotting evil, then you have to warn yourself. And we have criteria to be protected from that. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning them, those who plot evil, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in their hearts, He knows their plans, He knows their plots, and He knows what they're doing and what their objectives. So, they, so do they feel secure? Afa'amina. Do they have that security? Where do they get that security, those who plot evil, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not يَخْصِفَ اللَّهُ بِهِمُ الْأَرْضِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would uh, cause the earth to swallow them. Where do they get that security that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep them safe and they will continue with their plots and they will be okay? Isn't that the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to make khasfa to them, to have a sinkhole, you know, the sinkhole when it just takes away people, swallow people. You know, what, what, make them, uh, what made them secure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not do that to them when He's able to do all things? Or, أَوْ يَأْتِيَهُمُ الْعَذَابُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يشعرون. So the first one is that, that the earth would swallow them. Or, punishment come to them from where they do not perceive. You know, there's punishment that can come when people perceive or ex expect. Whether they are warned against a specific punishment. Or they did something and they knew the outcome of it. This can be, you know, it can happen to them. But here, أَوْ يَأْتِيَهُمُ الْعَذَابُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يشعرون. The punishment comes to them from where they don't expect. And read about the stories of the nations before. Punishment that came to them from where they did not expect. Did Pharaoh expect that this is how his end is going to be? Did Pharaoh expect that Musa السلام, the one that he raised in his palace under his protection and he spent money on him to raise him in his house, that Musa السلام, becomes the source of destruction of Pharaoh? He did not perceive that. Pharaoh had all the power and the means. But the punishment came within his own self and the plots that Pharaoh had, it just circled him and he was uh, you know, basically seized from his own plots and plans. And the same thing with all of the messengers before and their nations and so on. So part of the punishment, some of the punishment, is from where they don't perceive, they don't feel it's coming and it comes onto them. The next verse, more of the different types of punishment of Allah. Do they feel secure that that would not happen to them? Verse number 46. Or that He would not seize them during their usual activity and they could not cause failure. Or that He would not seize them, to punish them, to ruin them, to destroy them. 
uh, even though the word from akhada when you take someone or you take something so do they feel secure that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not take them in punishment seize them in punishment fi taqallubihim in their taqallub al taqallub is there uh, when you when you flip something upside down right and the word al qalb is the heart constantly changing that's what the, it's called qalb for so taqallubihim is when you also when you sleep and you keep on moving to the right side to the left side so taqallubihim in their usual activities throughout the day you're at home in the morning you leave you're in a car you're in the street you're at work your work can be a factory can be a, a school can be a field many different things you're changing your position constantly so do they feel secure that the punishment would come to them while they are in their usual activities that keep on changing when you look from above to the earth and what people are doing some at home some in school some at work some in hospitals all kinds of things people are doing their normal cycle of life so who would then say what well, the punishment is not going to come to them while they are in that state it can happen that's the power of Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things فَمَا هُمْ بِمُعْجِزِينَ They cannot escape the punishment from Allah if it's decreed for them. People they think or some of them they have an idea or maybe some foolish idea, maybe because of movies or something, that the punishment of Allah just take one form or it can happen by just one form. And they would see the, uh, the, the way of it before it happens so that they would save themselves before it's too late. It does not necessarily to happen that way. So, أَوْ يَأْخُذَهُمْ فِي تَقَلُّبِهِمْ Take them in their their normal activities and they would even have abundance of wealth and they're enjoying themselves or having just a great time and while they are in the midst of this the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to them as the nations before the next verse which something that brings again the fear of Allah why do these people they think secure that, that, that these things would not happen to them verse number 47 <laughs> فَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَرَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ Or that he would not seize them gradually in a state of dread, but indeed your Lord is kind and merciful. And this needs more explanation. أَوْ يَأْخُذَهُمْ The same way, or he seized them, take them in punishment. Here, عَلَى تَخَوُّفٍ While they are تَخَوُّف تَخَوُّف from الخوف, it has two meanings basically. Right? And that's the importance of knowing the tafsir of the verses. The first meaning, the apparent meaning is, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seize them while they are in the state of fear of the punishment of Allah. So when people see that the, the, the punishment is coming, like the people of Thamud, when they were given three days, and after the three days the punishment will come to them and they saw things are changing, so they see the, the punishment is coming, or the people of Yunus, and they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, like for example, if people are you know, they will be destroyed by a storm and they see the, the storm is happening or is coming. So the, or uh, they, they see the, what comes before the major destruction, like for example, diseases or viruses or drought or uh, famine. And then after that, a major catastrophe would happen to them. This is something that can happen to the people. People think that if they're facing some difficulties, it's going to be over with and then they will return back to all kinds of goodness. But what if one of the ways for their destruction is there is some things that they fear lead them to worse, which is the punishment of Allah. This is one meaning. Another meaning, which is uh, the Arabs, they use the same word, at-takhawwuf. They use it and Umar radiallahu anhu, he, he sought this from those who understand the linguistics of the Arab, the Arabs. Uh, that they use that word in, in the meaning of a tanaqus, in the meaning of having less of something. So whether they have the fear of something or the other meaning is that they have less of something. So they are given less provisions and that would lead them to have the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So أو يأخذهم على تخوفين So different stages or different states that people can be upon and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to them. Do they have security that it's not going to happen to them? فَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَرَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ Indeed, your Lord is لَرَؤُوفٌ For deed, for sure, no doubt about it, that He is the most kind, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He's the most merciful. Even though He's able to seize the people and destroy them in whatever state that they're in, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most 
compassionate, the most kind, and he is the most merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala, which shows the favors of Allah. The favors of Allah by showing the power of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all of these things or any of these things. But it shows also the evil. It's beautiful verses because it shows all kinds of things at the same time. It shows the favors of Allah upon the people when they're not really punished every time they commit a sin. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this power that no limits to it. But He's the most kind and He's the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shows the evil of the disbelievers and those who plot evil because they don't have any security from the punishment of Allah. They think that they won't be punished. Because if they know they would not plant this evil that they're upon, which shows how evil they are. And it shows the different states of human beings that they go from one to the other and they should always in all of these states, they should have the fear of Allah. And that's what the believers are upon. They fear of Allah and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from the punishment of Allah. We'll continue inshallah ta'ala with the rest of the verses after the break, so stay with us inshallah. محمد رسول الله محمد رسول الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Welcome back and with verses 43 to 50 in Surah Al-Nahl and we just finished 47 with the different mention of different states that human beings can be in and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can happen to them. So do those who plot evil, they are secure from this? It's a way to bring the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hearts to show the evil actions of the evil doers. But the verses ended with beautiful names and attributes of Allah that Allah is the most kind and He's the most merciful. This is not how people are treated on the face of earth that the punishment of Allah comes and just you know, cover them all and they're all seized and even though they would deserve this, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most compassionate, the most kind, and He's the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be deceived. Uh, be grateful to Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not punish us. Even though we deserve to be punished because we're sinful, but Allah is the most merciful. So to be, uh, to acknowledge that, to be grateful to Allah, to be obedient to Allah, to seek forgiveness and to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afterwards in verse number 48 uh, saying to the people, disbelievers and each and every one of us, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ يَتَفَيَّأُ ظِلَالُهُ عَنِ الْيَمِينِ وَالشَّمَائِلِ سُجَّدًا لِلَّهِ وَهُمْ دَاخِرُونَ Have they not considered what things Allah has created? Their shadows inclined to the right and to the left, prostrating to Allah while they are humble. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا did they see with their own eyes and consider the power of Allah that would make them humble themselves to Allah and benefit from the fact that they're living on the face of earth to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone? Did they consider and see that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all things and one of which is that the things that has shades to it, right? the shadows, the shadows of ourselves, objects, buildings, Anything physical that has a shadow, the shadow by itself is an amazing creation of Allah that many people, they don't reflect upon this. It's one of the ayat of Allah. And when it goes to the right and when it goes to the left, according to the position of the sun, this is from the signs of Allah. And human beings, they only see the physical aspects of things. But this creation of Allah, they are in state of humbleness to Allah, in state of submission to Allah. The shadow does not choose to change its position based on its own desire or own decision. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the sun. He's the creator of these, the way the shadow is governed by the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Everything is owned by Allah and they're all in state of submission to Allah. And they are sujjadan lillah. They prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they are in that state of obedience, state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after stating this, and these are matters of seen and unseen at the same time. There's no creation of Allah unless it's in state of submission to Allah. Only the human beings, they have the willingness whether to submit or not to submit in only uh, a window of actions. Otherwise, we are all in state of submission anyways. When we were born, when we die, the way we live our life, you know, and that's where the arrogance of the human beings, when they are given the ability to make a decision or to choose something, why they become so arrogant? 
when it's everything, all the matters is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 49, And to Allah prostrates whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth of creatures and the angels as well, and they are not arrogant. See the word, and they are not arrogant. This is the key word to be safe from uh, all kinds of evil things. And the opposite of arrogance is to humble oneself, and that's the key word for someone to be obedient and submission and state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all kinds of goodness. Is this, this, this uh, kindness, this uh, humbleness that would require submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to Allah, walillahi yasjudu. Yasjud continuously, present tense, continuously. They are prostrating. Everything is in the heavens and everything is in the earth. Min dab, every walking creature, they make sujood. Right? Human beings, we know how the sujood are. We know how the sujood is, right? We, we know what sujood is. When you make salah, you make sujood on seven bones, as the Prophet ﷺ said. Your uh, toes, your knees, your uh, hands, your palms, and your forehead and your nose. You make sujood on these things physically. This is how the human beings look when he makes sujood. But do we know how the animals make sujood? Sometimes people, they become uh, silly in the sense they when they see an animal or a cat or a dog, they, they look like they're making sujood like the, the, the human beings. They say, oh, mashallah, they're making sujood. Where do they get that from? There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Right? We have to uh, respect the minds of people because we as Muslims in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, the truth is right there. So everything is bilbayinati wa zubur with clear evidences and proofs. It might maybe look cute for example a person would, a person would say that or, and resembles something. Sure, no problem. But they make sujood. So don't wait and hide for the dog or the cat or the cow uh, 24 hours surveillance to see you know, the cow making sujood is not going to make sujood like a human being making sujood. But the cow, the fact of the matter is, the cow makes sujood. And the cats and the dogs and mindeb, every walking creature, they make sujood. Does it mean that they're just, they are humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not literally physically making sujood? The ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about his creation. He subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, وَلِلَّهِ يَسْجُدُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْدَبْ to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yasjud, make actual sujood, what's in the heavens and what's in the earth, min dabba, which means with every walking creature, wal malaika, and the angels, they make sujood to Allah. And we know for a fact, as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, that ma min mawdi'i arba'i asabi'i, there is no space of four fingers unless there's an angel making sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the angels, they make sujood. How they look when they make sujood, Allah knows best. We don't have that unseen revealed to us, but they make sujood. And the creatures, the, the animals, all of the things that walks on the face of earth, they make sujood. And it doesn't have to be like the way we make sujood, but we believe in it the same way. So this is, has to be clear. And what sujood entitles, when you make sujood, that means, that means what? That means you are in the most perfect, humble state that is away from arrogance. And that's a sign that a person is a, is a believer when really his heart is also making sujood, not just physically. So this is the most humble position when you see someone in sujood, the most humble position. You're making sujood to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Your head, which, which is your, you know, the most respected and the most honored and the most protected part of our body, which is our head, right, becomes on the ground. On the ground, right, in the most... A humble way whatsoever and that's why the heart also should be in that state of humbleness and we should be upon this humbleness while we are making salah and the Prophet ﷺ, you see as, as the verse says وهم لا يستكبرون, they, they are not arrogant those who prostrate to Allah they are not arrogant if you want to make sure that you are not arrogant and don't praise yourself we should not praise ourselves I should not say I'm not arrogant you should not say I'm not arrogant we should just take the means not to be arrogant and leave the matter to Allah. 
because we don't know really exactly what's in our hearts deep inside. But our actions to humble ourselves to Allah, one of which, as the Prophet ﷺ said, as a way to enter Jannah, he said to the companions, Anas and others, عليك بكثرة السجود. Be upon frequent sujood, and sujood here refers to the salah. Make lots of salah. There's no sujood by itself like this. Unless it's sajda shukr, sajda of tilawa after reciting a verse like this. Verses, for example, if you make sujood, but you have to recite it yourself. Or the one that is reciting it makes sujood and then you follow him. But sujood by itself like that is not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but rather to make salah. And in salah you make lots of sujood. Because every rak'ah has two sujood in it. So, أكثروا, uh, you know, عليك بكثرة السجود, make lots of sujood, فإنك لن تسجد لله سجدة, because indeed you would not make one sajda to Allah, unless إلا رفعك بها درجة, unless he would elevate you a level with that one sajda, وحط عنك بها خطيئة, and he would expiate a sin from you by this one sajda. One sajda to Allah, he elevates you. See the, the result here? And that's what the cure for arrogance, that the more you humble yourself, the more that you will be elevated. And the more you elevate yourself, the more that you will be humiliated. So don't elevate yourself in an arrogant way. Humble yourself to Allah. The more you humble yourself to Allah with sujood, with salah, with ibadah, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate you in this life and in the hereafter. And also when one of the companions of the Prophet when he came to the Prophet used to be from the people of a Sufa, from the poor people sitting, uh, living in the back of the Masjid of the Prophet because they were so poor. They didn't even have enough clothes to cover themselves or they don't have enough food. They would fall from hunger. So he brought one time the water to, for the Prophet to make wudu. Uh, and the Prophet he was just both of them alone. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, Sell me, ask anything from me. Wallahi, this hadith needs a session by itself. Why? Because this Sahabi, very poor as we heard, and the Prophet ﷺ is saying to him, Ask from me anything. And he left it open like this. And he's the Messenger of Allah. His dua is accepted by Allah. The Sahabi did not, the first thing that came into his mind was not food or shelter or house or cars or family or any of this that we uh, go crazy over. He said to him, أَسْأَلُكَ مُرَافَقَتَكَ فِي الْجَنَّةِ I ask you to be your companion in Jannah, O Prophet Wasallam. These are the people that had the perfect wisdom and the perfect reason and intellect, the smartest people on the face of earth because they want what's everlasting goodness. So after he said that, the Prophet Wasallam said to him, غَيْرَ ذلك, Is there anything else? This is another, you know, uh, you know there, 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 another way for him to ask anything that he wants. Okay, he got the Jannah, he asked for Jannah, then ask for worldly matter. Then this is the opportunity to ask for wealth and health and dwellings and all these types of things. But the amazing thing is that this Sahabi, he said, which means this is it, that's it. That's, uh, this is the only thing that I want, is to be your companion in Jannah. It's not to forbidden the other things, but how focused they were. And then what is even more amazing, that with this purity of the heart of these companions, the Prophet ﷺ did not say to him, well, you're granted what you asked for. He said to him, فَأَعِنِّي عَلَى نَفْسِكْ بِكَثْرَةِ السُّجُودِ And that's the shahid, this is why I mentioned this hadith, which means help me against yourself with lots of sujood. Yourself is like your enemy. You have to overcome the weakness of yourself. By what? By making frequent sujood. The more you make sujood, as we heard in the hadith, elevates you. The more you make sujood, humbles you. The more you, that you make sujood, you're away from arrogance. So you see how the ayah talks about everything makes sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any walking creature, وَهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ They're not arrogant because of that. Then the last verse, which is verse number 50, يَخَافُونَ رَبَّهُمْ مِّن فَوْقِهِمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ They fear their Lord. يَخَافُونَ رَبَّهُمْ مِّن فَوْقِهِمْ they fear their Lord above them, and they do what they are commanded. And this is what the benefits of the sujood. The sujood of physically and the hearts are in state of sujood, humbled themselves to Allah. They fear their Lord. And you put that from with the previous verses because the punishment of Allah who can guarantee not to be punished. 
right? Uh, the, punish, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is real. And the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is real. So how can someone live his life in a state of forgetfulness? So the angels, the, the walking creatures of Allah, right? And the righteous among the human beings, they fear the Lord from above. He's above all, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ And they do what they have been commanded. It is not just a feeling that they have, but to be truthful in your fear of Allah is that you do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you. This is the proper fear. Not a feeling or a person say, I fear Allah, but then their actions is not according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded. These are beautiful verses, beautiful meanings that we don't really serve it in the most perfect way. Otherwise, we won't be able to finish the verses of the Quran. If our hearts are pure, as Uthman radiallahu anhu, he said, مَا شَبِعْنَا مِنْ كَلَامِ We would never be satisfied from the words of Allah. We want more and more. But why we don't have this is because the hearts is polluted, corrupted, uh, filled of all kinds of things that we need to purify our hearts with the Qur'an. The more we read Qur'an, the more we make sujood and make salah and seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by saying, la hawla wa la quwata illa la tuki, seek help from Allah by gaining that strength to achieve what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained upon us. Uh, we'll stop here inshallah ta'ala and we continue next time with more verses of Surah Al-Nahl. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إلا الذين تابوا وأصلحوا وبينوا فأولئك أتوب عليهم وأنا التواب الرحيم فادعوا الله مخلصين له الدين ولو كره الكافرون يا زكريا إنا نبشرك بغلام Shahidan wa mubashira